This is Pet Life Radio. Let's talk pets. Hey, cat lovers. Welcome to Nine Lives with Dr. Cat. I'm your host, Dr. Katherine Prim, and I'm a small animal veterinarian and cat lover. Everyone knows I am owned by a crazy cat called Scamper. And today, I'd like to discuss something that's a little bit in the news. There was a story that kind of broke recently about a rescue group that had recruited human physicians to perform surgery on their rescues. And I don't want to get into the exact specifics of the case or the group, but I thought it was an awesome platform to bring in Dr. Courtney Campbell so that he and I can kind of educate you on what it means to be a veterinarian, why you wouldn't want to take your pet to your own family doctor, your physician, and maybe just some ethical and interesting topics surrounding this case. So Dr. Courtney Campbell, of course, is a board-certified veterinary surgeon and a friend of Nine Lives with Dr. Cat because he's been a guest here with us. So I'm going to take a quick break and be right back with Dr. Courtney Campbell. We'll be right back. You know what I love? I love my cat. My cat Scamper has discriminating taste. He doesn't like just anybody. So when he acts like he loves me, it makes me feel good. Like, like somehow I made the cut. But you know what I don't love? Cleaning up Scamper's litter box. Which is why Arm & Hammer created new cloud control litter. There's no cloud of nasties when I scoop. It's 100% dust free, free from heavy perfumes, and it helps reduce airborne dander when I scoop. So what happens in the litter stays in the litter. New Cloud Control Cat Litter by Arm & Hammer. More power to ya. Let's Talk Pets on PetLifeRadio.com. Welcome back to Nine Lives with Dr. Cat on Pet Life Radio. I'm here with Dr. Courtney Campbell. Hey, Dr. Campbell, how are you? I'm I'm absolutely amazing. Thank you so much for having me. This is going to be a really interesting discussion and topic. And the truth is, anytime I'm on Nine Lives, it's always an interesting discussion. Well, it's kind of fun to have you, and and you're one of my favorites. Well, thank you for saying that. So I reached out to you because I saw this story, and... And like I said, I don't really want to point fingers or name names. I just want to use it as an opportunity to educate my listeners about what veterinarians do and what's the difference between veterinarians and physicians and, you know, just all the things that you kind of know about veterinary surgery. So, so we could just dive in. Well, most definitely. And I think that this was thrust into the public sphere for good reason. It is potentially a very controversial topic. And at the very least, it stimulates a lot of thought, discussion, and some actionable steps that need to be taken to to better define what's happening and what the rules and regulations are so that we can wrap our minds around this. And so those who are you know, uh, proponents of it, they can find a space and an avenue to do it. Those who are averse to it and do not want this to be done, they can have rules and regulations that limit this type of activity. To quickly back up for a second so that anybody who's listening who kind of understands this there, that story that broke recently had been under the surface, under the sort of the public eye, been investigated by other veterinarians who were looking into this, trying to figure out what exactly is happening with that particular organization. And that particular organization was their whole goal was to their efforts was to help dogs who they believed were doomed and homeless. And they used the term doom, meaning headed for euthanasia. And they saw an opportunity to perform surgeries to help these dogs. And they went ahead and did them. There's a major problem with that, particularly in those who disagree with it. And that is the people performing the surgeries were not veterinarians. 
And whether you agree with it or not, the license to practice medicine on people is separate from the license to practice medicine on animals. And the, the license to be an MD, a human physician, is different than it is to be a veterinarian. And that distinction, in my opinion, is there for a very good reason, but it is there nonetheless. And so that did cause some degree of uh, consternation among some veterinarians. It caused a, a sort of a, a vehement defense defense among those in the organization. And I, I like, I agree with exactly what you're saying. I know that they are, or at least I can assume based on what they've said in the public sphere, that they're very well intentioned and that they meant well by what they were doing. And what we need to think about is even in situations where you have people who are the most well intentioned, then they can still do something that's not right. And so I think in this situation, what we're trying to navigate is what does it mean to practice veterinary medicine? What does it mean to practice under the supervision of a veterinarian? And why would you choose to go to a board certified surgeon over having an MD or having somebody who's not familiar with, who doesn't have the training perform the, the actual procedure? So step one, why go to a veterinary surgeon? What is essentially, what's the big deal? And you'd be surprised that, you know, when you talk to uh, certain pet parents and you ask them about the specialties within veterinary medicine, a lot of them are, are surprised that the level of specialization has reached this level of, of care in the veterinary profession. For instance, I was uh, just in a pharmacy the other day and I saw a young gentleman holding his French bulldog and he was in line to get his medications and there were two young ladies who were sitting next to you know sitting uh, on chairs and they asked him oh my goodness that french bulldog is so cute and just uh, just uh, sort of overflowing with praise and adoration of how amazing this french bulldog was and i said he said well i'm concerned he you know he said i'm concerned about my french bulldog because i'm not sure he's going to live too much longer and their faces immediately dropped they said Oh my goodness, what's going on? He said, it's a heart issue. You know, it's a, I feel bad for him. Uh, I took him down to see a cardiologist in LA and uh, he, he told me about all the heart problems and I'm here to pick up medications for his heart. And they said, my goodness, there's doggy cardiologists. They were just out of their mind. You know, he said, well, there's doggy surgeons, ophthalmologists, dermatologists, and they were extremely surprised. So I think step one, we just need to do a better job of informing the public of surgical specialization. And then step two, more specifically, do a better job at talking about the training involved for a veterinary surgeon. So I, I want to interrupt you really fast because I, I want my listeners to understand the reason I noticed this story is because there was an image of a radiograph. It was a post-operative radiograph that was circulating on social media. And the minute I saw it as a veterinarian, and I'm not an orthopedic surgeon, the minute I saw the radiograph, I cringed because it wasn't done to the standards that I was trained just as a general practitioner. No doubt Dr. Courtney would have additional thoughts on that, but it caught my attention. Otherwise, I might not have even thought about this, but the pain and suffering and prolonged healing experienced by the pet who had this radiograph just breaks my heart. And so no matter how well-intentioned or how free the surgery is, we have to think about what that animal went through. And I think that's why I wanted to kind of talk about this. Yeah, no doubt about it. I mean, listen, I'll be honest, looking at some of those post-op radiographs, it's striking. It is really, really striking. And as you mentioned, heartbreaking. Of course, I have to put this in context, right? And I can't necessarily speak with any relative specificity about those radiographs. They could have been, those radiographs after surgery could have been to the surgeon's liking. I'll be honest, you know, as a surgeon, that is one of the things that you basically hold your breath. You work really hard on a particular surgery. Let's say, let's call it a broken bone, for example. You work really hard on a broken bone. You try really hard to get it together, put a nice implant, meaning bones, screws, pins, wires, those sort of things, and you want it to go perfectly. And you get everything set, you you close the skin and the, the layers, you bring the patient into post for x-rays, the post-operative x-rays, you look and it's not to your liking. And your your heart falls and you hang your head because you say, you know, I tried my best, but these post-operative radiographs, these after-surgery x-rays don't look like what I tried. 
And all of us have experienced that. But the radiographs that have been circulating online, I have to say, I don't think I've ever seen anything like that from anybody, not obviously from myself or any surgeon, even some surgical, even surgical residents. I haven't ever seen radiographs that look to be sort of non-adherent to just basic surgical principles. Now, those could have looked good and the dog was running around and they fell apart or that they could have looked like that immediately after the the x-rays were performed and the patient was brought immediately back into the surgical theater for revision or a redo of the surgery. That's very possible. So we don't know the context surrounding those x-rays, but I will say this definitively those x-rays looking at the one moment in time without context, they are disheartening, uh, both to MDs, you know, and of course, veterinary, veterinary surgeons writ large. So I think number one, let's talk about the training. Why do you need that level of training to help dogs and cats and to basically help fix dogs and cats where you see situations like that? I'll talk about from my personal perspective, uh, graduating from veterinary after, you know, four years of undergrad, graduated from veterinary school, usually at that point where I was in my career, some people had the opportunity to do a one-year rotating internship, which means you're in an internship and you are actually getting a taste, a potpourri, a sort of, so to speak, of all of the different specialties. You're in a general hospital, you are working with internal medicine specialists a few weeks, then you jump over to surgery for a few weeks, and then to dermatology for a few weeks, neurology for a few weeks, just getting a general flavor of all of the, the specialization within veterinary medicine. After that, you apply for a residency. It's extremely difficult. Lots of reference letters, applications, resumes, cover letters. The anxieties are high. You apply through a matching program. You either get matched or you don't get matched. If you do get matched to your ideal uh, practice, it's like you're you're celebrating and you're happy, you know, popping champagne. And if you don't match, it can be one of the most heartbreaking experiences of your life. After that, once you start your residency, it's a three-year program. Some people will do four years. After that, you take a ridiculously hard surgery board exam, uh, which is has three different parts, hours long, thousands of dollars, and uh, you prep for that exam sometimes 10 to 12 weeks of time. And it, uh, it has caused... I'll just put it this way, that experience, that experience, if you talk to most veterinary surgeons, it sticks with you. Regardless of whether you've been practicing 20 or 25 years, that experience starting from beginning to, and I don't like to say end because we're always learning, but that's the beginning from the undergrad process all the way through taking your surgery board exam, boy. That level, that that experience. It's. I don't want to say it's. It's like PTSD. No, no. I want to say it's more. It's more celebratory and more happy than that because you know that you've trained hard and worked hard to be able to have that privilege to work on 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 animals and and fix animals. But I, I just want to say that that is the level of training that you are encountering. That's the level of training that you're in the company of when you bring your dog or cat or whoever your animals to a board certified surgeon. Well, you know, this is news, right? This is media. And so there is some sensationalism that I guess I bring to this. But but I'd like to take a quick break and then come back and talk about, you know, what if veterinarians, let's put the shoe on the other foot. What if veterinarians did free surgery for people? We'll be right back. Has your pet ever suffered from digestive issues, anxiety, or joint pain? We want to address these issues and more with high-grade CBD oil from Alpha, made specifically for your furry friends. Using Alaskan salmon oil as a carrier, Alpha Pet's 500 CBD oil is lab-tested for quality, consistency, and safety. Plus, we are giving Pet Life Radio listeners 25% off and free shipping with code PL25 for a limited time. So visit myalphacbd.com slash dogs now. That's my alpha cbd.com forward slash dogs because your furry friends are family let's talk pets let's talk pets on pet life radio pet life radio pet life radio dot com <laughs> Welcome back to Nine Lives with Dr. Cat. 
And I am here with Dr. Courtney Campbell, and we are talking about this news story that broke in which human physicians were performing surgery on rescue animals, and they were doing so at no charge. Uh, and they they really wanted to save the lives of the animals, but things kind of went wrong. And so I posed the question to Dr. Courtney just for kind of shock value and to put it in a different frame of reference for my listeners. What if veterinarians went to an orphanage and adopted sick children and started to perform surgical procedures on them. I mean, that, no matter how you really want to see this, this is kind of one way of looking at what happened. What do you think, Dr. Courtney? Well, listen, that question you pose is a hypothetical, but I think when I think about a question like that, although it's controversial, although it really stimulates thought, it also has a very personal aspect to me. It also affects me personally because practicing in Santa Barbara, I actually had an experience where I saw a dog and I'll obviously keep the subjects uh, nameless, but I saw a dog who was experiencing severe difficulty breathing due to problems in the throat. And after I dug a little bit deeper as to what the history, collecting history, facts, details, what is actually happening? What exactly is happening with this dog? I had learned that this same dog had visited a different hospital. And I called that other hospital. And I said, what, what's the history regarding this Labrador? And they said, you know, this dog was experiencing throat problems. And the pet parent had actually performed surgery on this dog's throat. And I said, excuse me. They said, yes, this dog was experiencing throat problems at home. And the pet parent had actually performed surgery on his own dog, allegedly. Now, I'm just going to quote because uh, this popped up in a, a news article here where I'm practicing. And the news article was celebratory and rejoicing in this fact. Now, there's some glaring erroneous statements in the article. There's a lot that is neglected to mention and just some flat out, you know, factually inaccurate statements in the article. But just as a, I'll just quote from the article, the gentleman who did this said, you know, I've never operated on an animal before, he says, but I've been in a lot of third world countries where you have to figure out how to do medical procedures with makeshift instruments. I've always been good at figuring out how to make things work. So I've never operated on an animal before, but I've always been good at figuring out how to make things work. My challenge with that personal experience and then even this situation and the question that you just posed, the problem with all three of those is that isn't the time. A life isn't the time to figure out how things work, right? That life is so precious, human animal, whatever the species, that life is so precious that, you know, putting them well, through. What about the suffering? suffering? The You're dog right? putting, felt like 100%. he was suffocating. I mean, that's, that's terrible. And it's I, unbelievably terrible. We actually had to, we actually had to do throat surgery on that dog. And, you know, because the original surgery, as you can imagine, was done incorrectly, then there was, you know, if you're the second person going into a surgery that's done incorrectly, listen, I'll just be honest, doing surgery to begin with is challenging. But if you're the second person to have to go revise a surgery that was originally done incorrectly, then it just, it makes the scale of difficulty exponentially worse. So that was a challenge. And then it sounds like ultimately, after we were able to make some revisions to the surgery, the dog went on to have a, a decent quality of life and was able to breathe, but still had some major issues in terms of his breathing. And the particular gentleman who allegedly did this surgery was an ophthalmologist, had done a lot of eye surgeries on humans. So that, again, is another point that gives me, makes me cringe a little bit because this story that popped up and why we're having this conversation today are uh, general human surgeons doing orthopedic surgery who have no training in veterinary orthopedic surgery. The story I referenced is an ophthalmologist who's doing throat surgery on dogs, who probably, uh, and again, I can't speak to it, but I would assume that once you become that level, when you have that degree of, of specialization in your field, that the familiarity with the anatomy of a dog's trachea and the structures involved in that is 
you know, you're at a distant from you're you're distant from that. So so I think, so what about yes. anesthesia? I mean, that brings me to my next issue was pain coverage and anesthesia. This particular rescue did have a veterinarian there. I'm assuming that veterinarian was able to obtain controlled anesthetic drugs. But in your case, how did they anesthetize and provide pain coverage to that patient? Do you even know? We don't have the details. I mean, you know, you could understand why a lot of the details were hush hush once they saw the our reaction, once they saw, you know, how this was being received. You know, I'll just be honest. You know, there are some people who believe that if you see something, right, if you see that veterinary medicine is being practiced, if you see that it's being practiced to a substandard level of care, if you see just egregious problems and you don't report them. And you know about them and there's a record that you knew about them and didn't report them, you could actually be held liable as a veterinarian. So when we started hearing reports or when he started, you know, for lack of a better term, bragging or, or you know, sort of declaring that, hey, I have just recently performed surgery on my own dog. I'm an ophthalmologist. I have no training in this sort of celebratory. It caused a lot of veterinarians to recoil. And seeing that reaction, I think, caused him to be more reticent about providing the details. Where did you get the propofol? What pain medications did you use? How did you perform a tracheostomy? According to the article that I'm reading here, and I'll just reference it again so that, you, you know, I'm not speaking on a turn, but according to the article, he was sent a couple of YouTube videos on how to do a tracheostomy in a dog, and he just worked his way through there. So, I mean, there's so many questions regarding this, but when I see this story that we're talking about today, I think about that personal experience I had with that Labrador, and it, it, it gives me goosebumps in not in a good way. It's it really, I shudder to think that this is happening elsewhere. So I just want to be clear. I think this is a perfect opportunity, number one, to talk about training. And I think that we've we've done that, at least through my personal experience, because I know that there's people that have done more. But two, I also want to talk about the ethical concerns about, as you said, MDs or physicians doing surgery on dogs. And regardless of how you look at that, those licenses are separate. And if I started to go to an orphanage, like you said, and started to do surgeries on people as a veterinarian, I'm not too sure how that would be received. I'm sure there would be an, an uprising or sort of an outrage as a veterinarian doing surgery on people. There should be that similar level of consideration and that similar level of thought and discussion about MDs doing surgery on dogs. And I want to be clear throughout this entire discussion. Dr. Kat, I think you and I both agree that according to what they say, this group was very well-intentioned, right? Do you believe that? I do. I think that they feel like they were saving lives, and I don't think they gave any thought to all of these other ramifications, which is why I'm here, because I think you need to give thought to all of the ramifications. I refer patients, animal patients that I am legally permitted to practice on, I refer them to a specialist when I feel like I am not completely capable or qualified of handling whatever issue it is. So I completely agree. And so you feel as a responsibility, like, whoa, this is out of my wheelhouse. Let me uh, refer just out of a responsibility of what's the best course of treatment for this animal? What's the best course of treatment for this patient? And you find that it's to refer to a specialist and for them to see the appropriate, the appropriate specialist in that discipline. And I couldn't agree more. I think that you know, I want to be 100% clear. According to what the organization is saying, their whole goal, and they were very well-intentioned, they wanted to save lives, they felt like they were doing the right thing, and absolutely nobody is here to demonize them whatsoever. However, we have to talk about, we have to be clear about this, we have to be unapologetic in sort of declaring that and understanding that there are separations in the training and that there are veterinarians go through just decades of training in order to be able to do the same procedures. So what about the elephant in the room? The fact that surgeries can be expensive. You know, Dr. Kat, I think about the fact that when you have surgeries, I think about medical care in general, and I think about the fact that healthcare is expensive regardless of the species, human, dog, cat, whatever the case is, healthcare is just expensive. And it's particularly because it's it's a trickle-down effect, right? We know that uh, obtaining these supplies, obtaining the leases, obtaining the overhead, having the staff, having the lights on, just the amount of overhead that's required 
to have a very functioning hospital is challenging. Would you agree with that as a practice owner? Absolutely. But what people don't understand is that you and I cannot afford to do free surgery because we don't have grants. A lot of rescue groups and humane societies, they have grants where they can do these things. So they still get paid. But when you and I do things for free, we don't get paid. And that doesn't mean we don't do things for free because, oh, my goodness, every veterinarian does things discounted and for free, whether the pet parent knows about it or not, because we love we love pets. Well, that's a that's perfectly stated. And then the truth is, of course, I knew about benefactors, sponsors, but also grants. I don't think I knew about grants specifically that rescue groups, many of them still will get paid through donations, through sponsors, through grants, and private practices do not. And and that's why I think that it's so important to talk about, use this opportunity to talk about what can you do if you are facing a situation where your dog needs help and it's and you're unable to, there's some financial constraints or you're budgetarily conscious and you just can't do that surgery. That certainly doesn't mean that there's no hope. That doesn't mean that you should give up. But just a couple of things that pop into my mind. Of course, companies that offer a credit, a medical credit service pop into mind. There are hospitals, particularly private practice hospitals, that have set aside a special fund to help pets in need. And that is also regulated through a lot of sponsors and donors. And they'll say, okay, well, if you can't afford this particular surgery, let me talk to management of this hospital and see if we can, uh, if there's uh, you know, assistance that we can provide. Of course, friends and family, of course, GoFundMe, uh, shelters. And I have volunteered my time and efforts and expertise to shelters in my local area. And I did that when I was living in other cities as well. So I think that there's always, at least in my, my perspective, there's always an avenue, there's always an opportunity where veterinarians are donating, giving away free things, forgetting charges, and trying to, the best to make it as economically feasible for the pet parent. But keep in mind, if you get into a situation in which you're doing this, where you're not charging appropriately for the service that you're providing, then you can't have a hospital and then you can't save pets, right? And I think that you could speak to this even more fluently than a lot of veterinarians because as a practice owner, these are a lot of the things that you have to think about on a daily basis. Absolutely. And I just want the take home message for all of my listeners to be, you know, whatever you've got to do to get care for your pet, just make sure you get that care from a veterinarian because there are species differences. There are things that Dr. Courtney and I had to learn that we're not covered in medical school, only in veterinary medical school. And you are putting your pet at risk if you go through these external avenues. And so just don't exhaust finding an actual veterinarian to help you. That, that's really what I want everyone to take home today. Yes, no doubt. No doubt. It is at the end of the day, we have a situation where we have People who we have a, a one health approach, everyone, you know, everyone involved in this story, everyone who I mentioned, even the gentleman who did surgery on his own dog, which is just an egregious a wrongdoing in my opinion. But everyone involved from the people who uh, have d done things that we disagree with to the things that we agree with. I agree with you, Dr. Cap. All of us are doing it because we love animals, right? And we, because we love dogs, we love cats, and we're doing it for the best intentions. And sometimes you could have these great intentions and you could still go astray, either because you're just uninformed or because you were well-intentioned, but you just didn't consider all of the nuances surrounding that particular issue. So I think at the end of the day, that's what I want us to take, is that this is a, a one health a global sort of comprehensive look at, at health is that we all care about animals. I consult with, or I have consulted on the internet with MDs. We've also, we have MDs that are part of our orthopedic mass emails where we'll bounce ideas off of different veterinarians and say, hey, what do you think of this? What do you think of that? There are human orthopedic surgeons who will add in their two cents and their expertise. I think it's really important that we understand veterinarians consult with MDs, MDs consult with veterinarians because we're all focused on how do we improve the health of us collectively, regardless of 
of the species. And so I think that there's MDs all over the country doing amazing work, lending their expertise, lending their talents to help animals. And what we want, you know, is to make sure that it's just done in the right way. So if you have an issue and you're concerned about something or if you feel like you need a different perspective, contact your your primary care physician, your primary care veterinarian and, and ask them, who is the most appropriate specialist that I should see? And regardless of the discipline, whether it's dermatology, surgery, ophthalmology, cardiology, whatever the discipline is, talk to your primary veterinarian and ask them, do you think this is a case that needs to see a specialist? Because after Dr. Kat and I, after getting a chance to talk with you, Dr. Kat, I think we've given them, you know, just all pet parents a good rundown of the extensive training that's involved. I agree. And I hope that everyone gets the idea that we're not here to bash anyone for doing anything. We just want to make sure that pets do not suffer needlessly because someone was well-intentioned, but perhaps not as well-trained as we would hope, if that's a a nice enough way to say it. Dr. Courtney, I think that's a great place to wrap up. I appreciate so much you being with me here today, and I thought this was important enough to reach out to you and have this discussion. Can you tell my listeners other ways that they might be able to find you or see some of the things that you speak about? Oh, most definitely, and I would appreciate anybody who wants to reach out and just learn more about vet med in general or bounce ideas off or just celebrate that wonderful human animal bond that we have. We have great podcasts, anything possible. It's a space where we just get to celebrate all the beauty of that human animal bond. And we get to have some really interesting conversations with really interesting people about things that are happening all over the pet space, whether it's deep research or whether it's tech or whether it's a human interest uh, story. We get to just touch base with some great people who are doing wonderful things in that pet space. Of course, on social media as well, Dr. Courtney DVM on uh, Twitter, Instagram, and of course, Facebook as well. So reach out. Uh, I'd love to hear more. I think we could take a deep dive into even more exciting topics in the future. So that's anything possible also here on Pet Life Radio. You guys know that I'm Dr. Catherine Prim and you can look me up here on Pet Life Radio as well as social media, Catherine Prim DVM. And I'm always happy to hear what you think and what you want to learn more about. So feel absolutely free to tweet to me or write on my wall and you may see your question featured in one of the future episodes of Nine Lives with Dr. Cat. Also want to thank my amazing producer, Mark Winter, and I want you all to go out and have a perfect day. Let's Talk Pets, every week on demand, only on PetLifeRadio.com.